I appreciate your time. My name is Heidi Fritz Martinez. I own a company called Remotor America, which is designed to promote American products and also connect global access to energy efficiency. Uh, so um, I was part of a collaborative effort to do about $30 million worth of energy incentives, specifically for variable frequency drives. And I'm happy to help any way that I'm needed. So feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Derek Earp. I'm a facility engineer in uh, Cambridge, Boston area. And I um, work mostly with the controls and automation and um, yeah, helping companies. Thanks for coming. Good to talk to you again. <laughs> you too. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Thomas Trang. I work for facility maintenance tanks, uh, for sorry, I work for American University as a facility maintenance technician. I'm here to try to yawn and learning more about the VFD. Thank you so much, Thomas, for coming. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, um, let's see. Uh, one, one opportunity is, is that if you'd like to join uh, this group, um, it's actually this Nikola Tesla's collaborations. Uh, there's about 2,500 people in there so far. Um, I strongly uh, appreciated what you know Tesla brought to the world, which is the electric motor. Um, my family has been in this uh, since 1953. My father and uh, six of his brothers all started motor rebuilding companies back in the 50s. Um, still seven of them exist in the Midwest, um, rebuilding motors for power plants, schools, hospitals, a lot of irrigation, agriculture. Um, I've done a lot of studying. Uh, my um, schooling and stuff uh, brought me to uh, a mentor of mine, um, actually Curtis Reed, um, who was a, one of the, what used to be an RCA engineer out of Chicago. He took me aside when I went to college and he taught me a lot about Tesla. Um, and I also uh, studied a lot about AC, DC machines, um, <clears throat> synchronous motors, various types of motors. And so that, that career being around my father, then being in various businesses um, across the United States, I've been from, uh, I live in California now, but I've lived in Northern California, Southern California, uh, lived in Boston for 25 years. Um, and now I'm involved uh, uh, back in California again. I turned 65 this year and I'd really decided. I wanted to give, you know, give back to this industry what it has given me so much as far as, you know, happiness, a lot of friends. Uh, my father used to be a chapter president of ESA, which is Electrical Operative Service Association out of St. Louis. There's about 2,500 companies in the United States um, that all share collaborate information. Um, so from that, um, you know, we'll jump in here and, uh, this fellow is, you know, one of my mentors. So I just wanted to play a little bit who he was. When you think of electricity, you think of Edison, but there is one electrical genius who is nearly forgotten. A man who dreamed of giving the world an unlimited supply of energy. His name was Nikola Tesla. This is the story of a modern Prometheus who changed the world with electricity. It was Nikola Tesla who captured the power of Niagara Falls with his alternating current system and made it possible to transmit electricity to all of America and the world. Suddenly knew he could recreate this rotating field by powering the coils of a motor in different steps or phases, like the pistons of an engine. 
The resulting forces of magnetic attraction and repulsion would literally twist the rotor in a circle, the electrical equivalent of the wheel. And all this was accomplished with alternating currents. It would soon turn the wheels of industry around the world. Tesla was ready to unveil his motor to the world. The subject which I now have the pleasure of bringing to your notice is a novel motor which I am confident will at once establish the superior adaptability of alternating currents. When so the, the reason I bring him up um, is that the alternating current machine um, that exists out there um, is a fixed speed machine, um, pretty much fixed power, how much it draws. Um, and so what we literally have is we have um, hundreds of thousands of electric motors, you know, running every day um, in America and around the world that are, are pretty much set volume of how much they're going to use and pull, even though the loading requirements uh, vary, but they really can't adjust. So there's said there'd be like, you know, taking your car and, you know, going around town, putting it at 1800 RPM and then using the brake to stop it. That's the way the electric motor operates. So it consumes a lot of power um, and it ends up being about 70% of the power that the world uses, which a lot of people, you know, may or may not know that, um, or they try to go, well, I'm putting in lighting, so we're getting efficiency. Well, lighting most of the time is only about 10% of the total load. Um, you know, in a factory. And so it's kind of minuscule of how much they're really going to save. And a lot of times they'll put it in and they won't really, they'll put in new lighting, they won't see much change in the power bill. Where when you put it on electric motors properly applied, um, it does have a very large impact. So where power is used on motors is a lot of it, about 51% of it goes to motion. Um, conveyors, crushers, um, you know, big applications, steel mills, those kind of things. 19% uh, is in the HVAC industry, um, fans, pumps, compressors. And lighting is about, you know, 16% of our power and 14% of it is other electronics and light uh, IT equipment, which we can't really do much about the electronics and IT requirements. You know, lighting we can do, but there have been a lot of light bulbs changed in the last several years and so that's has kind of been tapped out for cons conservation quite a bit of hvac was done in certain areas where there were rebate incentives um, but a lot of it still isn't or they kind of had a cap like in new york where they would do projects anything um, uh, down to about 20 horsepower and they thought, well, I was about 20 horsepower didn't really matter um, cost of equipment back then was kind of expensive that goes back 20 years ago um, nowadays, they're going all the way down to a quarter horsepower. They're even putting it on what they call EMC motors, which are directly onto, um, you know, real small motors. Um, but the main impact um, in HVAC is the chillers, the fans, the pumps, those big chiller compressors. Um, you know, those need to be evaluated if they don't have drive controls to put them in. Um, and then on the motion side, um, there's a lot of energy you saved also for other reasons um, by just slowing a conveyor down. You really didn't need to move the material quite that fast, or um, you know maybe it's a press machine that you know has variable hydraulics. Um, those are opportunities. Um, like Heidi said, we we were hired, or I was specifically hired back in the um, uh, '90s to go to, Cal go to uh, Massachusetts and do work for Milton Bradley Toys, Hasbro Games, all on plastic press machines. Then it rolled out from there. It went into you know, schools, hospitals, ice rinks, um, you know, uh, buildings. And you know, we did find by doing all these pilot studies a tremendous amount of um, you know, energy opportunities. Um, I also was involved with EPRI, the Electrical Power Research Institute, um, which documented, you know, many applications. Uh, there's information on the um, Department of Energy about VFD technologies. 
but there still seems to be a uh, a lack of uh, of motors being you know retrofitted. I think there are, the studies are today maybe fifteen, maybe ten percent of the motors in America have been retrofitted properly. Um, as compared to Europe, they're in the fifties and sixty percent range. Part of it is because power was more expensive there. Well, now that power is going up, it's definitely a point of uh, a big interest. And um, the thing that uh, this date, this slide's a little bit dated, but you know, an example of a 15 horsepower motor, you know, cost $450. Now it's almost, you know, $750, $800. But um, if it ran 12 hours a day, six days a week, you know, 48 weeks a year, this is back even 11 cent kilowatt. A lot of times we're now sitting around almost 22 cents. Um, over 10 years, um, that equated to the motor utilized $45,000 worth of power. Now it's more around 70 or 80,000. So the incremental cost of a motor is one piece. It's only about 1% of the purchase price. And if they didn't put a VFD on, more than likely it's not really controlled or balanced. Um, and that's something we really push with the Tesla um, concept is that you know, he was all about frequency and power. And, um, you know, it's basically uh, correctly providing the motor frequency and voltage to the motor that balances its actual load. Um, and it also then corrects uh, the motor to get all balanced power on all three phases. Uh, at seven this morning, we actually had another class, which we it's kind of a little bit more advanced class. It was talking about, you know, power quality, um, VFDs, um, various, you know, do's and don'ts, and um, you know how the structure of the of the of the machine is actually built, how a VFD is built, what the component parts are. Um, we'll be having that class again. Plus, if you look at our website, you'll see um, we have uh, we're going we're going to start posting the actual video, so you can go there. You know, look up the different area that you're interested in, you know, put it back. Again, my point is, is to, um, you know, start passing this information along. Um, it was actually developed by um, a guy named Nolan um, in the 60s and 70s, where he developed the soft start, then developed the frequency drive, you know, for NASA. Then it rolled out in the later 70s where Toshiba you know, who built the transistors in Houston started building the, the regular VFDs and then it rolled out from there over time. You know, back then, sometimes they were about the size of a phone booth. You know, now that they're like a, a maybe a, an eighth of the so physical size, a lot of VFDs now are re starter replacements, uh, DIN rail mountable, easy to put in, um, relatively easily to, to program. Um, we give programming classes. Um, for people to understand how to program them easy, what the key, key components are to watch for, you know, as you are putting them in and starting them up, um, and what you know what the value of you know why and where to put them properly. Um, so, uh, variable frequency defined does it, or defined basically is it's a you know electronic uh, package when connected to a motor is capable of controlling the speed and power to that motor. Um, they're a package design. Um, some people don't realize our uninterruptible power supply is basically a hybrid VFD that they're using. It's just fixed frequency output, but they're able to regulate and make sure that that power is steady. And then they use DC uh, batteries sometimes on the DC bus circuit to regulate. So even if the power is fluctuating out there, you know, it always has the DC to still build the output correctly. Um, uh, let's see, and it basically, you know, controls the torque and the speed of the motor. Um, AC power and DC power, the you know difference between, you know, what basically Edison was a DC guy and Tesla was the AC guy and Tesla the one that went out for Niagara Falls to, to put it in. Um, so again, you've got these rotating fields here that uh, was shown in the video there. And th they literally, because of the sine wave, you know, will trigger when the north and south pole functions on that coil. From that, 
as we speed up and slow down this frequency and voltage amplitude, we're able to control that AC motor, which before was not able to be done. And that's the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. But then when you do that, you get the, you know, the advantage. And then the difference between the, this shows a single phase set of coils on a four pole machine, where this actually shows um, all the sine waves of a three phase power. So when you have three power lines, you know, feeding to the motor. Um, one other point is, is that you can actually take a single phase input and drive a full develop because we're doing it from DC. We can develop full three phase variable, you know, going out to the motor. So there's there's advantages of savings there because a a single phase motor is about 65 to 70 percent efficient. A three phase motor is up in the 90s. And you have only about a one and a half to two percent loss in a VFT in its components, but the energy savings and balancing of power, you know, definitely correct for you know efficiency gains. Um, so this is just a little bit what we talked about earlier this morning is you know the the basic structure where you bring in the AC power here, convert it convert it to DC power. Uh, capacitor is just to filter it to make the DC very smooth. You got a coil inductor in here. They call it a link choke to actually just basically stop down, slow down a a, um, a capacitive and a and a circuit so it doesn't doesn't the current doesn't rush and surge. That's what that's there for. Um, and then it goes through diodes, I mean uh, transistors to rebuild through PWM back out to the motor, and then it gives you your current waveform. Um, you know, why use it? Um, reduce electricity costs, you know, up to 70%, especially on very low, lightly loaded motors or, or fans and pumps because of the cube law. Um, it, it increases motor equipment and life because you're you're unloading some of the facilities we've done on plastic processing. We've taken the a 2,500 amp service. And after we put drive controls on a majority of the motors on that system, ended up being around about a thousand amps of current draw at the end. So it does have some big impact. Um, improves the process, uh, controlling torque and speed and, and pumps and flows. It also takes a lot of decibel noise out. So we've actually seen, um, you know, a lot of facilities that you know don't require hearing, um, uh, you know, gear and stuff on because it's, it's brought the decibel level of the whole factory down. Um, and then, you know, there's also um, several types of utility incentives. Um, there's also uh, money out there that's called um, uh, zero cap X money from investment companies that you can access that allow you to implement projects. And there's evaluations before, after what you're going to save, uh, come to an understanding of what the savings are going to be um, and verified. And then uh, there's a shared savings program to just pay it pay it off over five years. After five years, you own the equipment, um, but you get it to do it, you know, zero CapEx. Um, let's see. So some of the areas we we worked hard on is a lot of light commercial um, fans, compressors, chillers, uh, cooling tower pumps, vacuum pumps. Um, we also did a lot of large commercial, um, you know, the bigger exhaust fans, compressors. They, they have what they call um, fixed applications and a lot of these incentive programs uh, to implement it where it's kind of like Tylenol for a headache, Heidi calls it, um, you know, where they, uh, they, they, they know what the impact is going to be. They know how much savings is going to be. So they know how much deferred income, you know, that they're going to see and get for incentives back from the public utility commission. The power company does that for one reason is they make money off of energy savings. Um, with the way this, their rate structure works. So that's why even in Massachusetts, there's about a half a billion dollars a year implemented for energy conservation in all segments. Um, variable speed drives have been have become a very large portion of that. Um, we were 51% about three, four years ago of all of the, about five years ago, um, all of the um, uh, different energy conservation modes the drive controls made the biggest impact um, for bang for the buck. So the dollars, um, you know, were very, you know, very well used and 
you know, elk. Um, so we've, you know, we've worked on, you know, a lot of manufacturing facilities, conveyors, different types of presses, um, extrusion machines, injection machines, you know, large, large scale food and processing, you know, oven fans, blowers, bottling mixers. Uh, we've done a lot of work for um, canneries, um, you know, PepsiCo, um, Coca-Cola, different ones where they have actually implemented the technology, you know, even on bottling plants that, you know, build, you know, 400 cans a minute. Um, there's a lot of, you know, fans, pumps and those things. Um, been involved a lot of municipal business, uh, water supply pumps. Uh, there's a lot of what they call Parco valves that are put in front of them to eliminate water hammer. When you put a drive control on, you can take that valve out and get those losses that are going across that, that head. Plus you're able to stabilize the, the pressure and voltage. So you don't have to have pressure regulation valves, you know, also on the output, you know, of the system, uh, a lot of the type of exhaust fans, uh, cooling tower fans, process chilling water. Um, we did some processing machines where we put uh, about 60 or 70 drives on uh, molding machines for an optical lens company. And we were able to take 300 tons of chiller off the roof, which they were using to cool the, the hydraulic oil chillers and also, you know, cool down the building. Um, a lot of compressors, um, uh, both uh, reciprocating, um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, both air and refrigeration compressors, uh, you know, balancing that out. There's a lot of them going in now on even rooftop air compressor or air, air conditioners on both the fans, inlet fans, outlet fans, and the compressor itself because we're able to balance like the um, newer, you know, air conditioners that come out that have a VFD built into them. Most air conditioners for houses now do that. They actually regulate, you know, getting the optimal point of that um, compression done, um, so they get the you know the proper amount of cooling out of them. And they, and also even on big chillers, they've you know, they moved that you know quite heavily. Uh, we've been involved in big ones that were involved in you know Las Vegas um, casinos. Uh, you know we've done them for schools, big big locations that you know. Again, the newer compressors are coming out with them, but we did some of the first pilot retrofits. We did ice rinks uh, where we put it on the chiller compressors to, uh, you know, freeze the ice. Um, a lot of pump, different pump stations. So the 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 main factor is is that you know as you where why they found that VFDs on fans and pumps were were kind of their biggest you know biggest hit at first was because you get the cube law. So if you slow a, a motor down um, 20%, um, the actual horsepower of the motor, the flow only drops 20%, but the actual horsepower drops by the cube factor. It's called the affinity law. So the, the, the motor is 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times 0.2, it comes out to uh, roughly about a 50% horsepower reduction, not a 20 point horsepower reduction, similar to what you do when you put a vein on or a valve on, you get that extra extra savings by the VFD. Um, you do have a you know one or two percent loss in the VFD, you know, because we don't you don't get anything for free. It does have you know a few losses in it, but um, the overall efficiency is quite dramatic. And what's happening in Europe is a lot of the motors now. Uh, they've also figured out that when you put a VFD on a regular induction motor, you know, down at anything below 70%, the motor efficiency starts decaying. So as versely over there, they're in version four of premium efficient motors, where they actually have permanent magnet rotor motors on there. And we're actually doing, being a lot involved in, in implementing new uh, permanent magnet motors that's similar to what the EMC motors are. Those are a DC motor that's you know rectified power from AC um, with controllers and stuff on them. Um, again, because you get a you get a better torque torque control of the motor. You know after you get down there, um, you know below seventy percent, and so you see about an extra 10, 15 percent. They kind of overlooked it for a while, but 
you know, every kilowatt counts. And so that's what they're starting to move forward in Europe is, is pretty much standard. So is China and is, or, uh, you know, other parts of the country that are going that way. The historic way of uh, changing power and speed was done with, you know, belts, pulleys, fans, sprockets, gears. Um, you know, we had, used to have multi two-speed motors. That's pretty much gone away where they had, you know, they would shift shift the motor in the windings and that would do a lot. Uh, they used to have variable pitch pulleys. Um, uh, any current drives on a big bunch of pumps and stuff that were out there. Um, and then, you know, the implementation of the, the AC um, frequency drive. So they were controlling it by vans, damp, you know, vanes, dampers, that's you know, the typical, you know, things that are in a building, you know, regulation valves. So this was, you know, the, you know, the typical of doing that throttling on the output of the water pump, you know, where now they actually, you know, open up the valving and then they control it with a, a VFD um, on a 50 horse, you know, 50 horsepower motor. So, you know, it does have a very big impact on, you know, total power requirement. Um, so this over five years, you know, uh, say about $4,000 a year in operating cost and about $20,000 um, you know, over five years. So, uh, it, it's definitely working, you know, you know, dipping in, plus you have your demand reduction because you're, you're just not running up to that 19 kilowatt anymore. Uh, let's see. So this, this is a sheet that talks about, you know, variable torque loads, constant torque loads, and then constant horsepower loads, which are you know, the, the, these areas, you really don't have too much opportunity. And what they mean by is like a machine tool, a lathe, uh, you know, milling, um, you know, punch presses and those things. There's really not a way other than like on a punch press, you may want to slow it down to, you know, slow the cycles down. But, you know, that you really can't do much speed control in here. So it's got to stay in a constant horsepower. You don't see a lot of savings. Um, but constant horsepower, constant torque power loads, you know, by lowering the speed, whatever you do get more of a linear savings. Um, and then like compressors, it depends on the type of compression it is. Um, you know, conveyors, it's whether or not you can really, you know, slow the conveyor down, let's say it's to a rock plant or whatever. Um, you know, printing presses and those things, again, the same thing. You know, there's vacuum pumps and things in there that you need to Take a look, mixers. Um, we've done a lot of work for um, various places that had uh, you know, mixing requirements. Again, back to what a constant torque load is. Uh, you know, variable. Um, um, and then, uh, let's see, we talked a little bit about this, you know, the difference between, you know, the flow comparison to with a VFD and you know, the flow amounts, um, you know, what the, you know, fan curve is. What, one thing I do, we also have a class that's on pumping that we're going to give uh, probably in about a month and a half again, two months from now, which is basically, you've you got to be careful when you put it in that um, the pump uh, has, a everyone has a, it has a, a pump curve. And so there's a sweet spot on a pump where it was originally designed for to run in a certain range and actually be at its optimal efficiency up around 65, 70% efficiency of the pump. Where if you go too far below or too far above, the curve goes off and sometimes it'll dump through deck down to 30%. And so you forfeit some of your savings. So it's definitely important to, to uh, you know, do an analysis well before we start you know, where, where we're at on the pump curves um, and also on the veins and those kind of things. And um, it slows that, it slows your ability to save. And then this is more of a, you know, typical pump curve, you know, with a VFD, but it just doesn't show in here, we have a software that actually shows where is the sweet spot to run the VFD in so that you, you design it, you set your upper and lower limits so that they stay in that sweet spot of operation. These are the infinities laws. Um, 
um, you know, flow versus speed, um, which ends up being more one to one. You know, your head um, to speed, you know, is on more of a cube factor. And then you've got your horsepower to speed, which is on the cube factor. So it's, you know, the head loss, meaning the amount of pressure it can produce, is about a two to one ratio. And a um, horsepower is that still a three. So you can reduce it, still produce pretty good head pressure in your system um, and, and achieve this. So it ends up being a combination of total power, say. Um, these are, you know, just some of the case studies that we were, you know, over time involved in. This happened to be a municipal, or not municipal, this was a cleaning facility, uh, dry cleaning outfit um, up near Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, that we installed the utility company. There was thirty-one thousand dollars worth of incentive available that we got. Uh, we're able to get one hundred seventy-one thousand in annual savings. Um, Twelve cents a kilowatt ended up being, and th this is the actual kilowatts amount, not the um, the demand. There was some demand reduction, but we were talking specifically about kilowatt hours saved. Um, and this ended up being about a 20,000 annual savings, about 102,000. And I think that was around about 30 or 40 drives installed there. Um, this happened to be about a million square foot facility. First walked in, they said, oh, we've got drives on. Yeah, they did everything above uh, 30 horsepower. Um, uh, about a hundred motors later um, found in the facility. Um, incentives about 305,000. and you know, had a couple hundred thousand dollars with annual savings. So it, it's definitely good. You know, Heidi came up with the concept about, you know, being a motor hunter. Um, they're all hidden in the walls in the back rooms. You know, and people don't necessarily see them every day. You know, they feel them. They feel the fans and the cooling going on in the building, but they, they don't necessarily do it or a production facility. You know, I got to have that machine running. So they and they didn't go over this would be a water facility, water supply facility. Um, Implied, you know, uh, and put it on several, you know, the um, lift pumps, several of the um, booster stations. Uh, again, they had some throttling going on, and then just balancing of of getting again back to balancing the frequency, voltage, and power to demand, you know, the facility. And the nice thing about controls today is they have a lot of unique software in them, so you can actually pre-program those properly to run. You know, you know, in those applications, um, exhaust fans, um, you know, ventilation upgrades, um, uh, makeup air. You know, again, on upgrading those, um, and these happen to be in some Midwest locations where the the utility rate was much cheaper. You know, than some of the the coastal locations. Um, you know, what to do when you're going out and evaluating. Um, you know, you want to, you know, look even deeper at the, you know, the non-typical because there may or may not be incentives on those. Um, and, you know, these are some of the questions we've had over different times we've given, you know, things is, you know, what's the drawback of installing DMD control? Uh, most of people say upfront cost. Um, you know, the, um, what, what's the real savings going to be over time? You know, how do we get them commissioned, installed properly? You know, where do we find the right staff? Get them done. Are my motors compatible? Um, you know, and how much timing are we going to lose, you know, installing it? Uh, and then we've had other other issues. But these, these are some of the biggest drawbacks. And, you know, the upfront cost can be overcome by several of the application ways you can get funding. Um, again, Heidi has... You know, Remoter America, where she has access, you know, to uh, about 35 states plus. Uh, we cover 100 of the state or 100 percent of the states. You know, also with the zero cap X programs. Um, you know, where you can put the you know equipment in, so it eliminates that upfront cost. Um, we also have ASRAE auditors available um, if need. You know, where they can you know go in and review, you know, sites, look at them, you know, get you the detail. Um, and, you know, give a realistic view, both to the CapEx funders and to you as the, 
um, you know, operationals of the buildings. Um, and then we also then, you know, help with a, you know, making sure commissioning plan is done. And we're also here to, uh, to answer questions. So I get a lot of calls every day from various people around the country um, that are, you know, running into a problem or whatever. There, there seems to be less, less people going into the, the trades industry than there were, you know, years ago. And so there's, you know, kind of a lost, uh, a loss. And so people kind of have a, you know, a fear factor. We, we want to take that fear out because it literally can be up installed, install time. Um, you know, we, we've installed, you know, hundreds and hundreds of drives and you know, without very little shutdown time on a factory, um, you know, to then be all mounted wire ready to go and then, you know, convert it over in about 15, 20 minutes properly programmed. Um, uh, so is that part. Um, so, you know, you want to conduct the audit, you know, get some flows and per pressure information, um, projected, you know, savings evaluations. You know, we literally have uh, thousands of locations that we've done and been involved around. Um, and, and not from one vendor. It's not an issue about, you know, trying to be sole vendor or sole supplier. That's not, that's not the point. We, you know, some people do have certain brands and stuff that they've, you know, gone accustomed to. Um, you know, we have some access to those or, you know, we can use just a recommendation through um, this ESA organization of, you know, where to find the right products, you know, to get them, you know, cost effectively. Um, get that pre-evaluation. Um, and then also there's a lot of, extra incentive sometimes to put it in where you can put in what they call measure measurement verification. So the drive controls have uh, kilowatt hour meters, most of them built in. So you can you can data log how much actual savings you're getting out of that machine um, and bring it back to your BMS system, um, you know, through various networks. Um, they are compatible. Um, again, then, you know, getting the compatibility correctly to the motor is really key. Um, we really recommend people to take pictures of the nameplates um, so that, you know, uh, a motor guy can actually look at it and see, okay, what was its design? What was its, you know, amperage loads? Uh, there's been, you know, application errors made because a, a 900 RPM motor at, you know, 100 horsepower can, has this different amperage rating than a 900 or the same motor in a 1800 RPM motor. So, um, and you can't turn a, uh, a, a 1800 RPM motor down to 900 RPM and get the same torque out. So it's important to understand the torque factors, especially, you know, in more constant torque loads. Um, but, you know, we've ran into facilities where, you know, they went to bid, looked at the application, got it all installed, you know, everything was to spec or what it was, but somebody didn't look at the the RPM ratings, and you know now they literally cannot run those motors over 50 hertz, so they'll trip out all the time. Um, they just have too much amp draw, and you know it, it you know caused a little grief. Um, you know they're getting around it, but you know it's not it's not the best way to do it. Um, these are some examples. Um, we've been in these were medium voltage motors put in a power plant. Um, these are about 750 horsepower. We put it on the uh, the draft fans um, in the middle there. Uh, and we put it on both the boiler feed, uh, pump one and pump two in there, which feed the boiler uh, water into the, the boilers so that they could control that. There was a 10% a service factor that they had to build in that they could never go over that. Right. Well, they were able to, by regulate the speed up to about 62, 63 hertz, they really get the extra amount of water that they really could use at the boiler. And it actually increased the output of the plant um, by almost another half a megawatt. Um, that simple adjustment, you know, did it. Um, and then by the time they put drives on all the other parts of the facility, um, you know, they saw about another half a million dollars worth of savings um, just on all of the other ancillary fans, pumps and stuff that it takes on a power plant. So um, we're giving a class, I think around the 15th or 20th the next month. It's on our website. Um, the talks about those applications for power plants. We've also been involved in uh, medium voltage facilities for 
um, 330 megawatt gas fired plants. Um, it's another way to get you know, get more power without having to build more generation out of existing equipment. Um, you know, we we do highly recommend that you do you know, look at the quality of, of the drive controls. There, there are differences in drives, and one, one thing you can look at is the the carrier frequency of where the where the motors you know can operate at. Um, some really say you should never go over four or five kilohertz per wave. Well, the, the better ones, you know, go up to 10, 12. Um, and also that means that the transistor can fire faster um, and build a better, better waveform. Um, you know, you, you want to look at the construction, um, you know, of the capacities. Um, we don't sell variable torque drives. We really feel but what a variable torque drive is actually a drive that is a constant torque, meaning 150%. Overload for one minute, um, derated to 125 percent. So they're able to put that on a 100 horsepower drive. They can put it on a 125 horsepower motor on a fan or pump. They get away with it most of the time, but the problem that you run into is if you get a lot of surging, that transistor is a little bit weaker. So my dad always told me, you know, put a little bit more into it. It isn't very much more expense, but it sure does cost you a lot less down and downtime in the future. Um, and most motors, especially in the pumping industry, are tend to be ran in the service factor. So um, you want to make sure that the motor's in a in a good spot. Um, let's see the type of enclosure that you're you know putting it in. Um, you know whether it's got uh, you know the controller is actually built. Um, we have some controllers up to 120 horsepower you can put outside. Um, they have the ability for disconnect switches, you know, put in uh, the fuse protection and stuff required into them. We would recommend putting the high speed fuses on the front of drives, not just circuit breakers. Um, it it improves the life, especially if you get a lot of surging power. Power quality is is getting worse in America because of, you know, the various type of power sources we have now. You know, it's not the old fixed generator. We got solar coming on and off different times of year, so they have to they have to constantly trans transition and transmission shift on and off you know various parts of loads you know to balance that and those those imbalances could cause a lot of motor failure um, and we've we, we talked about that this morning a little bit further and um, you're welcome to watch that video you know when it comes out uh, again we've had uh, impl implementation. Uh, I was involved in the Electrical Power Research Institute when they first did the evaluation in the 90s about uh, upgrading injection molding machines. Um, we actually brought a lot of that to market. That's why I ended up in Massachusetts. They brought me there to the Milton Bradley Toys and uh, um, Hasbro Games in Rhode Island and plus, you know, thousands of other machines um, there and also around the country and even around the world. Uh, today, it's a pretty much a standard in the machine. Um, but there's also, um, you know, checks and balances. Those machines where you have a lot of high spiking power, so there's you know, a lot of a lot of requirements as you install those um, and have make sure that the drive is suitability for it. Um, drives create a soft start capability. Um, you know, helps the original inertia into the motor. Um, you get your peaking. Some are used for peaking load reduction, so you can literally take some parts of your load you don't have to shut the machine turn down like your chillers and stuff you can just drop them back to maybe 80 percent it may raise the temperature in the building but you you can get some incentives back for that um you know for a facility um so we we can help you with how they how they do that where they're looking for you know additional you know peak shaving money um you know out there um heidi maybe you can jump in what you what you did for a couple of people of getting also from the uh, the state funding that you did. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the time. Um, I think that a lot of missed opportunity is connecting economic development and workforce development into the energy picture. Uh, so there was a situation in Massachusetts. I won't say the company name, but um, 
where they were only going to give him about $50,000 worth of incentive, but the project, including another project, was well over a couple million. And uh, they refused to budge on it. Um, it was, you know, we don't really consider that a priority. It's too much money. Um, and so in getting different state officials involved, uh, they actually covered the entire project 100% between a combination of those monies. Uh, so sometimes in the, in these things is you really have to be able to hold the customer's hand or figure out how to leverage um, the savings and what that means to the economy in which that comp you know that business is located uh, in order to really help a lot more. And he ended up getting like a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar molding machine that wasn't even part of our project. So I think raising awareness to that, you know, you can't on the news say that climate change and all this stuff is a priority and then on the other side make it impossible for someone to participate in your program so fortunately since then there's a lot of other programs you can take advantage of and you don't ever have to have your power company's permission in order to save energy so um, if, again anytime i can be of help please just reach out um, and thank you for the time so the um, you know potential issues with the VFD, you know, you got your high initial cost. Well, that, that's where we feel even even that is not what it was. Um, you know, back where some of this was written, actually back about you know seven years ago, um, VFD prices have have dropped uh, dramatically. Um, sometimes not so much in the United States. I don't know why, but there seems to be some Property of prices or something compared to what's you know happening. We're we're partners with um, facilities in England, um, uh, Italy, Germany. Um, uh, there's also a lot of people. Oh, you can't get them right now in America. Well, there actually is access around the world that you can get them from. Um, you know, the ensuring the proper control strategy. Um, you know, so that they'll just they get installed, they get properly controlled to a sensor. Um, and or BMS system, um, you know, we we work hand in hand uh, both with the building management systems, and we work hand in hand with the, you know, the the controls. And at the end of the day, they can operate by their own. You've got a pump running a, a pressure, you know, regulation. Um, it can all sit there and operate, you know, without even having to be tied to a BMS system and still save the same amount of money. Um, there's issues um, of concern when you get above a large number of drives about harmonics because you were, uh, and we talked about that earlier today on our other meeting, we go into more detail, you know, as you get involved in this to, to how to get in scope and, you know, pre-study a facility. Um, it's becoming more and more issue across the country. We're working on a project up in Ohio, or I guess Michigan right now, um, for a facility, you know, where they're getting hit with a $25,000 a month um, uh, power factor and harmonic penalty um, because the building, because of COVID, is not being fully loaded anymore. So the chillers are not running at the optimal point that they were originally designed for. They're all sliding off the curves, but the cost to try to change those chillers out is astronomical. So there are technologies out there um, that can go on the front and be active. They call active front end um, equipment that will clean it all up and you know give it all sign to soil back to the power company, which then they're happy. Um, their hybrid meters don't pick it up, um, and it you know cleans it up you know cost differently. Um, you know again you know how much can you turn it down to the suitable need, uh, and then feedback controls. Um, you know most drive can be. Today's all have the, you know, both zero to 10, four to 20, um, you know, PLC control input. So you can, you know, program it up, you know, to the actual application. Uh, many of them, you know, can go into the smart building integration systems, you know, where they have BACnet, um, Profibus, DeviceNet. Um, uh, let's see, a lot of them have um, easy programming. A lot of them are designed now. Where you have a zip drive where you can have a set of parameters 
for one drive, you know, you got another repetitive one down room. You can just download the parameters in. Really, really cuts on time of you know startup. Um, this happened to be on a facility up in uh, uh, Lowell area where um, you can see here, this was the, the loading factor of everything prior. And by the time we put in the BMS and drive controls, um, we end up seeing about a 45% reduction in their total power bill. Um, so again, they have prescriptive incentives, like Heidi calls them, you know, Tylenol for headache, or custom, which takes more data is all. Um, and the better the data is pulled together of what the power company needs to go on in so that they can get their money back to the Public Utility Commission. Um, it's just important that that detail gets done. We've done thousands of applications, both custom and prescriptive to help people out. Um, there's low voltage, you know, up to 480, 575 volt, they consider low voltage, the 200 to 575 volt are all low voltage rated. We've also do medium voltage controls that go from 2300 volt um, up to uh, clear up to 13K if you need, because they, they do build inverters that actually um, build power. They transmit power or DC and then put inverters on the back end side. But majority of stuff we deal with is medium voltage, which is 4160 volt motors um, in America. Sometimes there's 6,000 volt you know, overseas. Um, and then, you know, the energy management system, there's also incentives um, to apply for there as a combo, um, you know, to get the, uh, again, get maximum incentives, get least amount out of pocket, um, you know, to cut those utilities. Um, prescriptives, you know, is the most common, um, pretty quick applications. Um, uh, you know, they will give some incentives on new, um, but they really don't do too much for replacement. You know, if one goes bad, um, determine incentive amounts. Um, so th this is what the you know apps look like. Um, they have different categories that we check off, fill out, um, and then these were the are the incentives. Incentives have pretty stayed much the same um, for these up through 150 horsepower which today, you know, on 150 horsepower motor, $1,250 is a very, still a very, you know, good incentive for that. Um, the drive cost may cost you, you know, six, 7,000. So you, you know, it, but you've got money for install. Um, and, you know, we help people, you know, uh, choose some of the, you know, correct vendors and uh, if that's right. These are some useful resources. Um, for the uh, Officer of uh, Energy Efficiency, um, also Department of Energy um, Decision, um, Motor Decision Matters, which were for a lot of the original motor rebates. Um, uh, NEMA, you know, um, down in uh, Washington, DC, you know, about combining. So, you know, I, I wanna th thank you for attending. Um, we like to keep these about an hour. Um, we've gone, about 55 minutes or 55 minutes. I'd like I'd like though to you know please just open up questions. We'll stay here for a while, whatever you need, you know, just answer questions as you need them. Um, but we appreciate you attending. Um, uh, we will have the video available. We're set up a new system where the videos are going to go on to the website um, of one of our companies, ACDC Hotline, and it'll actually have an access um, to the Tesla. Um, videos that have gone on in the past so you can you know as you have time you can be able to go back to the youtubes you know and and see the various recordings and you know listen, listen to these classes we've done i've given probably now already my career you know hundreds and hundreds of these various seminars for both power companies water companies um national groundwater association um you know electrical power research epri m you know the ieee groups um, I, I, again, my, my father got me into this industry. I love the industry. I want to see it succeed. I want it to, to help save, um, you know, power, um, create some of the, you know, carbon, you know, content that we're dealing with that, uh, 
you know, everybody's, you know, worried about, which is, it definitely had some impact, you know, things have changed in climate. So um, I don't think we need to, you know, be quite as um, worried about some people think we are, but, you know, the power cost of the amount of energy that's consumed by electric motors, you know, can be controlled and stopped, slower, slowed. Um, as if you've got to go put up, you know, wind turbines or serb or sun or solar, you know, systems to off shoot that that uh, power, you're still having a wasted energy. So you can, you know, reduce your wind farm, reduce your solar intake, um, you know, if you really control the source and get in it to optimal efficiency. So thank you again and uh, open it up for questions if you have any. Hey, Roger. Yeah. This is uh, John Jobaleski. Hi, John. Hi. So we had um, communicated a while ago in the past. Um, I work for Aero Electronics. Are you guys looking for a distributor like Aero to be a distributor for your products? Yeah, yeah, we are. We 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 just want to have more people that um, you know can kind of train train people what we feel is if you train people to become motor hunters, you teach them about some of the factors of how to put a VFD in properly. Um, 